you can build a kit that you keep in your home, that you keep in your car. I've got a kit that I keep at work because anytime this stuff happens, I got to go to the office, right? Uh, But build a kit that has those essentials. The things like your batteries, your flashlights, extra cell phone chargers, things that you would expect to need during an incident where you may not have access to your electricity or to your utilities. What would you do if your gas went off at home and you needed to feed your family? How would you do that? have non-perishable foods that are available to get you through a couple days. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Spotlight Houston, where we bring you the best of the people, places, and events in Houston. This week, we learn more about how the city prepares for and responds to citywide events like hurricanes and floods. We sat down with Brent Taylor, Chief Communications Officer of the Houston Office of Emergency Management. This is episode 102 with an original air date of Monday, August 26, 2024. And now your host, Blanca Quesada. Hi, I don't know about you, but I was left majorly traumatized after the after Hurricane Barrel hit and then that surprise storm that hit a few weeks before that. It was very scary and very difficult. And fortunately, my family and I were okay, but I know that many of you are still dealing with the aftermath of both of these weather phenomenons that happened. And I'm really sorry about that. And I know that recovery is very difficult, but there is one thing that I did learn through this experience. And it's that even though I thought I was well prepared, I really wasn't. And after talking to most of my neighbors, I realized that they weren't prepared either, knowing that hurricane season is not over yet, probably isn't over until October, November. I decided that I needed to get an update on what I needed to do to be prepared. And I thought that it would be helpful for you as well. I've invited Bryn Taylor, Chief Communication Officer of the Houston Office of Emergency Management, And he's the person that knows it all. It's like, I went to the source. And I mean, even if you do know, it's always great to be or to have a a refresher, right? It's like going to college and getting a refresher course. But so welcome, Brent. Hey, thank you so much, Blanca. Yeah, I'm really, you don't know how happy I am that you're joining me because you're the person that I know can help us to stay safe in any type of emergency happening in the city? Well, maybe not me personally, but that's certainly our goal at emergency management. (laughs) Okay. Well, before we get started on everything that the Office of Emergency Management does, what is it that you do? I am the Chief Communications Officer for the Office of Emergency Management. I handle primarily public affairs, media relations, communications, During those disasters and large-scale special events like we're talking about, uh, I serve as the manager for the Joint Information Center, which is the the communications hub for the city and all the departments that are responding to an event. I'm the go-between for all of the the experts in their their communications field to make sure that we're all uh, talking, speaking the same language, so to speak, even if that is multiple languages, that we're all, we have a unified message and that we're all working together to make sure that the people affected by the event have the right information at the right time to make that right decision for themselves and their families. Yeah, yeah, that's important because we have a very culturally diverse community, a huge city with people from all over the world. Absolutely. And, yeah, it's in something like this, it's really important that everybody gets informed. For so, sure, for sure. We're regularly communicating in English and Spanish, and we've added Vietnamese. We have many of our disaster preparedness resources also in French, Chinese, Mandarin, and Arabic. And so we we really do work to get the message out to as many people. Uh, That's six languages. Uh, There are more than 100 spoken across Houston. So we know that it's not everybody, but it is percentage-wise, it's a large percentage. More than 90% of people are going to be reached by those languages. Yeah, probably someone in the family does speak English and can help the rest of the family right, uh, or their community. But so is it your office the, or the Office of Emergency Management that sends out the, the alarms that we get on our phones or on TV? 
Some of them, yes, depending on the type. So if you're getting an Amber Alert on your phone, that's coming from the state, Texas DPS, Department of Public Safety. They're the ones who send that out at the request of various police departments. But Houston OEM can send out, and, and other jurisdictions in the area, can send out what are called wireless emergency alerts, which is very similar. It, it, your phone responds to it the same way it would an Amber Alert. So you get that special buzz. It kind of does that override where it doesn't look like a normal text message, all of those things. So those can come from our office. And you'll also get those from the National Weather Service as well. Yeah. We, this past year, Houston has had just this incredible inclement weather. And every time it hits, it's always a surprise. Can you give us a recap of what we experienced and how OEM handled the situation? Sure. Starting right in January, as we were getting ready to handle the Houston Chevron Houston Marathon, which is an event that we coordinate on every single year. As we were getting ready for that, uh, we started getting some cold temperatures. And then in the immediate days, uh, I believe right after the marathon, the, the marathon itself was cold. And then we went into a hard freeze for a couple of days. And so that involves standing up uh, warming centers overnight. So places where if people didn't have power or didn't have shelters, they could go overnight just as a place to stay warm, stay out of the elements. We we worked on that incident and assisted in the mass care needs there, working with non-government organizations, faith-based groups, folks like the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, all those guys. Make sure that the people who really needed it the most had the level of care that uh, was required for the event. And so that was January. We had a few months of kind of special events. We worked the rodeo. We worked the marathon, as I mentioned. And that's just where we're looking at the potential for an incident. So there may not be something that we expect or anticipate, but we're in a posture where we're prepared if something does happen. God forbid, like the shooting at Lakewood. That ended up being a yes. relatively isolated incident on a very populated campus, right? And so we... As soon as we learned about that, we started putting together pieces that if they needed them, things like family reunification and family assistance, we have plans for those kinds of things. And if the event called for it, which thank God in this case it didn't, we were ready to do those kinds of things and to reunite people and get them the resources that they need. So we had a few months of just kind of special events and normal things. And then right about what the end of April, beginning of May, it feels like we got hit and we've just been taking the punches ever since. So that's, when we, yeah, we had the flooding that was primarily to the north of us that inundated the Kingwood area where they had to have, there was an evacuation order that was put in by Harris County. And so areas of all along the San Jacinto River, kind of near Lake Houston area, all were part of the evacuation order. So that OEM had a big hand in. Again, our job is really kind of behind the scenes serving as that nerve center. We can make the high level decisions so that the people who are on the ground don't have to worry about that. They're staying focused on their tasks, right? Mm -hmm. And the tactics they need to do that search and rescue or to do that evacuation, whatever it may be. And we're kind of guiding things with those uh, leaders from the involved department, from the mayor's office, from uh, those non-government organizations, things like that. Just the coordinating point. everybody. Exactly. We are the chief coordinating office for the city of Houston during disaster and special events. So from the flooding in Kingwood, we barely got a break before we got that incredible, really, for us, what seems to be a once-in-a-lifetime storm, the derecho. And so that is a uh, large straight-line wind event that tore through kind of started in Northwest Harris County or came in through Northwest Harris County, went straight down through the Spring Branch area, uh, through the Heights, into the heart of downtown, and then out uh, to the east, kind of following the 290 into I-10 out towards Baytown. That storm went all the way to Florida um, before it actually wrapped up. So a very large storm with very strong winds and you can still drive downtown and see the board on the on all the windows to, to yeah. know that we're still recovering from that one. Yeah, I had family and friends that, and I also didn't know, but these my family and my friends just happened to be going out to dinner mm -hmm. and enjoying the evening, and they didn't know that this storm was coming. Nobody knew, and so they got caught in it, barely made it home, but they were okay, and this was totally unexpected. Certainly to the level that, that we experienced. When I, I remember that day when I was leaving the office around 
four o'clock or so, we had information that there was going to be there. They were anticipating a thunderstorm watch or thunderstorm warning for the evening. It was not nearly as significant as what we ended up getting, right? That's not what we expected. Right. And getting right. those those catastrophic, truly catastrophic winds uh, that we saw. You're talking 100, 110 mile an hour straight line winds in the heart of the city of Houston. Uh, something we haven't seen. Uh, the last time we had a, a derecho in our area was on Lake Livingston in the early to mid 80s. Uh, we, we did a little research with the National Weather Service. And the last time we had anything close to that, and it was... Lake Livingston. So the impact was nowhere near as uh, it wasn't as populated as what we have here in the city. And so that's when we got our friends from FEMA and the uh, Small Business Administration and all the federal organizations that was declared a disaster. And so we started getting the resources from FEMA and from the SBA where they set up disaster recovery centers and business recovery centers. And they put survivor assistance teams out in the communities to to start working with people so that they can work towards being made whole. And then straight from there, we went into Hurricane Barrel. Yeah. Well, with that storm, I was, again, just caught off guard and terribly scared because it felt like the windows in my home were just going to blow out. And then when I saw the office buildings downtown with no windows, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I am so lucky that I that my windows weren't blown out. But I never had that type of experience before. And I was just terrified, terrified. But for people in the Houston area, we haven't had a significant wind event before that derecho since Hurricane Ike in 2008. And there will have been storms and there are tornadoes here and there that have come up. I know we had a tornado that was kind of on the southeast side of Harris County, Pasadena area last year, but nothing as widespread that had such a large impact since Hurricane Ike in 2008. And and that's when you're looking again, we had with this derecho, we had 900,000 plus people who were without power, many of them for up to a week after the storm. And then mm-hmm. lo and behold, Hurricane Barrel comes through and we run into that same massive power outage issue that, that really taxes all of the resources. It taxes the resources of right. uh, the individuals, of the, the responders, of the infrastructure. It's very challenging. No. Just when everybody was kind of relaxing, it became a double whammy for Houston. But with the hurricane, it didn't have that same impact where I thought the windows were going to blow out. But it was still very scary. It was still very scary. And then now we're experiencing extreme heat. Yes, we are. So over the past couple of years, so if we go back to 2022, the city of Houston activated its extreme heat plan which is the emergency plan we have for whenever we get these heat advisories and excessive heat warnings. We activated that over two weekends, I believe. So a total of four, maybe five days. Fast forward to 2023, we activated it for 52 days over the summer. So we saw a significantly warmer season that really challenged people who are, again, living in homelessness or who are doing a lot of outside work. So your construction workers, your public works folks, solid waste, all the people that we rely on to keep the city running, they're outside sometimes 10, 12 hours a day, and they're in a heat index where it's 100 degrees. It feels like it's maybe 100, 115. It's just absolutely unlivable. And so then this summer, we've already seen. So in the derecho and in Hurricane Barrel, because of the power outages, we activated that emergency heat plan as well, the extreme heat plan. And then just because of the weather, we've had to activate it, I don't know, probably a dozen days this year so far, but not quite as bad as it was last year. But tell that to me whenever I'm driving home in the weltering heat, right? It feels just as bad, even if it's not as bad on paper. Those are things, those are the kind of things that something like extreme heat, you wouldn't think of as a quote unquote disaster. But when it's taxing the resources and it's causing potential illnesses and deaths, to be frank, Mm -hmm. that's something that we keep on our radar and that we work to with all the departments to coordinate to mitigate the impacts from whatever that hazard is in this case. Well, Brent, what type of a kit should we build in order to be prepared any time during the year? 
So that's the good news, right? Is that these things, we can't predict what they are. We can't predict where they're going to hit. We can't predict how they're going to impact us, but we can plan for ourselves and our families so that when that impact happens, when we do get hit by the next storm or the next God forbid, terrorist attack or chemical release. This city has got all sorts of things. We're, yeah. we're a potential target for any number of incidents. And right. so you can build a kit that you keep in your home, that you keep in your car. I've got a kit that I keep at work because anytime this stuff happens, I got to go to the office, right? <laughs> but build a kit that has those essentials. The things like your batteries, your flashlights, extra cell phone chargers, things that you would expect to need during an incident where you may not have access to your electricity or to your utilities. What would you do if your gas went off at home and you needed to feed your family? How would you do that? Do you have non-perishable foods that are available to get you through a couple days. Our Houston OEM recommends having a stock of supplies to last you about five to seven days. And that can be things from clothes to prescription medication, if you're That's on any kind of, if you have any kind of durable medical equipment or um, a wheelchair or a, a battery powered anything, having the resources to recharge that. If you use, again, in the case of when we're talking medical, if you use oxygen, do you know how you're going to get your next tank of oxygen when your current one runs out. Could you sustain your oxygen through a concentrator if you don't have power at your own home? Do you know where to go to get that essential life sustaining care? So yeah. uh, those are the kind of questions we want people asking. And then they build their kit out from there. I don't have nearly enough time to explain it to you, everything that you should have in your kit. But we have a website at HoustonOEM.org where you can go and click on our prepare tab. So HoustonOEM.org and click the prepare tab. And it has a very exhaustive list that you can go through and just check off one by one to make sure you have the things you need to keep yourself and your family safe. Yeah, just basically think of what your family uh, will need, like, for example, blankets as well. Absolutely. And maybe raincoats and umbrellas and things like that. Definitely. We don't want people like stuffing their whole life savings under their mattress, but having some cash can definitely be important when the power goes out. There may be the opportunity to maybe not every store is open, but maybe your local HEB is and you need to pick up that one thing you forgot. Well, if their mm -hmm. credit card machine's not working, you're probably not gonna be able to leave with it. But if you have a little bit of cash, I know in this digital world, it's hard to even think like, what is cash? I don't know. But having some cash available, again, not to go broke, just having a little bit of money here or there to get those emergency supplies that you may not have or become an issue that when they weren't an issue before, right? So things may yeah. change in your house that require you to get something new. And of course, our really important documents like birth certificates and passports and things like that too, right? Exactly, exactly. And we have that Houston OEM, we have some, some branded waterproof document bags, those plastic bags. If you've ever worked at retail and you needed to drop money at a bank when they've got those plastic bags that you seal with the money mm -hmm. and the checks in it. Very similar idea. Then you can put things, yeah. So your birth certificate, social security, insurance paperwork, anything, the deed to your house, whatever you need to go that that you would want to make sure you have copies of. And then in addition, take pictures of those things and store them, send mm -hmm. them to yourself in an email so that you have them in a digital form in case that even your waterproof bag, maybe it blows away or something. So you have something to start from whenever it's time oh, to get that's a great re idea. redone afterwards. Yeah. So how can we get a hold of these bags? So if you want to reach out to us, you can go to HoustonOEM.org. And there's a survey about halfway down the front page that says disaster preparedness materials. And so you can go right there. And if you've got like a civic organization or some type of community engagement, we're glad to come out, give a little presentation about how to be prepared, what you need to do, how to build your kit, how to make your emergency plan, what information you need to stay informed and uh, kind of talk about knowing your neighbors as well. So given those four tenets of preparedness, and then we can give you some of those, the resources as well. So the waterproof document bags, the disaster preparedness guides, all sorts. of. Things. But the other thing that I was going to ask you about is generators, like people in that have homes. Well, they can set up their generators outside, but a lot of them might try to set it inside as well. And then there are the people that live in apartments, condos or high rises who will try but that's a no, right? That's right. That's right. Especially 
if you are setting up a generator, and this was an issue that we saw significantly during both the derecho and hurricane barrel, instances of carbon monoxide uh, poisoning and carbon monoxide sickness uh, went up significantly in those that week following each of those storms because people were using generators to keep their food safe or keep their their lives going, right? Keep the things in their house running. But they would run them, even if you run it in the garage and the garage is open, that carbon monoxide will still build up inside of the garage. It'll rise and and it'll create an environment that you can't, you won't know it, but all of a sudden you're going to be sick from the, the impacts of carbon monoxide poisoning. And if you are running a generator at least 20 feet from your home is how far you want it. You want it in an open space, preferably like a, a parking space or a driveway or something that's far away, far enough away from your house that you get space and that that carbon monoxide that's burning off from the generator has somewhere else to go. Um, And you don't want, again, certainly don't ever run it indoors. Don't run it in your your garage uh, because we do see those instances of of carbon monoxide illness and carbon monoxide. Yeah, nowhere near a wall. Yeah, right, right, (laughs) exactly. I know you mentioned chargers for phones or maybe our laptops, but what can we do if we don't have access to the internet during bad weather. That That is something that we saw that we've been uh, pivoting so much in current day. There's this perception and it's really a false perception. Most of us do have phones and most of those phones have access to the internet. But in the aftermath of Hurricane Barrel, we saw that not only was the electricity out, so people's phones would die and they wouldn't have a way of re- recharging them. The many of the cell phone apps, towers in the area were impacted. And so the network accessibility was very limited. And so that's when you see it's like, well, you don't have access to social media. You don't have access to your email. might not even get a phone call. How are we going to reach you? And and really the answer is that we're sharing this information with as many people as we can with things like uh, Spotlight Houston and with uh, small radio shows, low power radio across the city. That's really the backup is traditional terrestrial radio. And that's why one of the things we're talking about building the kit is having a battery powered or they, they still make those like crank radios where you can turn yeah. a crank and it will power it as yeah. an emergency resource. And we certainly will share all of the information we can with our partners in radio. And we're also going to put a lot of that information as much as it as we can at the local uh, city facilities. So once the city starts to open up again after a storm, go check at your community center, go check at your library, check at your multi-service center. All of those locations will eventually have some information about whatever the recent hazard is, if it's a hurricane or or whatever it is. And so we want people to know they can go to those places, even if it's just to make connection with someone who can get them the information, mm-hmm. right? Because it's not always immediately available. It also makes it scary because if you need help, you can't contact your family, you can't contact friends, you can't even contact your neighbor. That's a difficult situation to be in. And then there are a lot of elderly people that are living at home by themselves also having a lot of major issues. And like you said, a lot of them also have medical issues and the oxygen tanks that I know I heard that some people had run out of oxygen and there was no way that they could get the help they needed. So one thing that I can tell you that I am extraordinarily proud of, the way that Houston OEM facilitated the what's called STEER, the State of Texas Emergency Assistance Registry, It's a Mm -hmm. list that individuals who have disabilities, access, or functional needs can sign up for, and they can share a little information about themselves that may help us as responders during an incident. So they could say, you know, I uh, have blindness and I use a cane to walk, or I am bed bound. They can provide different information about whatever their disabilities or, or functional needs are so that when an incident happens, we can make contact with them and we can check on them. We can uh, do phone calls. We can do we've done in-person visits during a uh, hurricane barrel. We sent firefighters out uh, to 1500 in-person door knocks across the city for people who were on that registry. We had not made contact with yet through phone calls and through like automated calls and person to person calls, neither one we were able to get a hold of them. So we sent them to knock on doors because we want to make sure that those most vulnerable people are taken care of. 
Yeah. I'm surprised that they were able to drive through the streets with all the trees that had fallen, all the wires and electrical equipment that fell. And there was a time when we were telling people certainly stay off the road. The, the first, what, two, two and a half days after barrel, that was really the key message was don't even try to leave yet, right? Need And one of the first things we do once kind of the, the, the water lowers or the winds die down in whatever the case is, uh, we start that debris management plan. And uh, initially there's a, a protocol that's called cut and clear, where essentially you're just going through the streets pushing everything off to the side, doing a little bit of trimming just to get those main thoroughfares open. So your Westheimers, your main streets and all those kinds of places, we, we clear those main thoroughfares first, and then we go onto the, the tributary roads uh, afterwards. And so, uh, but yeah, no, initially the message is certainly stay off the road. And then once we can, once it's safe for us to start making those trips, we, we do that and we go and we so that's why in that first period, we're doing mostly phone calls to those people. And if we don't hear from them, which in the case of cell phone outages, we had a larger percentage that we didn't hear from for this storm than we did for the derecho, where the cell phone was not as impacted as significant. During derecho, we only did about seven to 800 door knocks. It was almost twice that for Hurricane Barrel. And, but I'm extraordinarily proud of that work. It's It shows the city's commitment to the people who need our help the most. And I think that it's really, we've gotten a lot of questions about it. And frankly, I mean, I don't want to toot my own horn, but we're serving as the model across across the state, certainly, and even some other uh, jurisdictions outside the state around the country have looked at us and said, how are you doing that? What are you doing? What's, what's yeah, this? you got so much experience now. I don't know <laughs> if that's a good thing or not. <laughs> 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 so also kids, we can't forget kids. For and sure. For say, sure. I've got, I have three kids, five and under. So I have a five-year-old, a two-year-old and a one-year-old. And part of our planning is to make sure, again, we have backups for those tablets because kids love their tablets these days. And oh, we also have that we have things like soft toys and other things, coloring books in case we don't get battery power back or we can't recharge yeah. those batteries, other toys that they can have to keep them focused on something besides the yeah. storm or the disaster. Yeah. And when we have this inclement weather, sometimes it's difficult to call 911 if you have an emergency. I picked this up from from Angela Blanchard, who works in the mayor's office. You're, the first responder is not going to be the police officer or the firefighter. That's not the first responder. First, first responder is your neighbor. You are the closest to your neighbor to help them whenever something happens. And so to build those networks so that who's around you and what they may need. If you're listening to this podcast, congratulations. I have deputized you to take care of your neighbors. Go out and make those connections and say, hey, the guy from Houston OEM told me I needed to talk to you to see if you have everything you need. So that's what we really need because those communities, and this is one of those things that's documented, communities that are stronger and that are have those stronger community ties are likely are more likely to recover more quickly and more completely than those who are a little more disparate. Well, Brent, thank you so much for updating us on what we need to do. How do we need, how we need to prepare. So uh, would you mention your website one more time and maybe a phone number that we can call? That's exactly what I was going to do. A great idea. So uh, you can go to HoustonOEM.org and that's where we have all the resources for how you can build your emergency kit, what to put in your personal and family emergency plan, all the phone numbers you would need for various organizations, how you can sign up for, excuse me, sign up to receive alerts, text messages, things like that. So that's HoustonOEM.org. And then if you want to do things like order those kits that I mentioned with the waterproof document bags and things, our, again, our website has a, a flyer on it, but you can also call 713-884-4500. And the person who answers that number should be able to connect you with someone who can help. Hopefully everything's going to turn out great the rest of the year. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I hope I don't have to be on TV anytime soon. When you see yeah. me on TV, that's usually yeah. not a good sign because something is happening. Yeah. I hope I don't see anyone anytime soon. <laughs> when does hurricane season end? November, the end of November. So technically November. it is from May 1st to November 30th. Okay. We got plenty of time now to be prepared. That's right. <laughs> well, thanks again. And of course, thank you all as well for joining me for this week's Spotlight Houston edition. 
And as always, if you have any comments or suggestions, please get in touch with me and stay safe. And again, if you have story ideas, please get in touch.